Welcome to, the, to everyone for today's Housing Hive and thanks for taking the time to be with us today. A bit of a different uh, type of session today. As you know, some of you will know we usually run through specific sort of digital transformation based topic in terms of challenge and potential solutions or we have a housing association with us talk through that journey. But as we were at Housing 22 CIH's event last week, which is of course a really big deal for the sector, we're going to run through a bit of a, a roundup of some of the digital based um, topics and some insights we took from the event, including some of the some of the um, talks that my colleague Jenny ran through as well. So hopefully those of you who attended last week hear something that you might have missed, or for those of you who didn't manage to attend at all, you should get a bit of an idea of some of the insights from the event as well. So we'll run through uh, the agenda today, which is just quick intros into myself and our guest Beth from today as well. Um, it'd be great if you could stay on mute for now, if that's okay, uh, just so there's no background noise for everyone else and, and for the recording as well. But do everyone feel free to use the chat pane. Um, there'll be a few links and things dropped in there by my colleague Joe as well. Um, if her internet's resurfaced, that is anyway. So have a little look out for those. And uh, yeah, we'll run through the topic for today, which is a bit of a roundup of the event from last week. And then um, we'll have some time at the end for a bit of a Q&A for myself, the Proto team, or um, Beth from CIH as well. Um, okay, so we'll get started. So on to intro as so well. I'll start quickly. I think I know a few of you are ready from, um, from working with you at Pro. There were some conversations we've been having currently. So for those of you who don't know, my name's Jacob. I recently moved into the head of sales position at Prodo. So my job is to essentially connect with housing providers and other organizations who are looking to transform in some ways with digital, offer some early stage consultancy services to align Prodo's products and services with, with, with those briefs essentially and help, help those associations transform with the likes of websites and portals and other, other sort of digital services around that um, with the goal of bringing some new Prodo customers on board. But um, as I say, we've got a guest with us today, Beth. So I'll let you say hello, Beth, and intro yourself rather than we do it for you. Thanks, Jacob. Um, yeah, my name's Beth. I work for CIH. Um, I'm their digital manager. So I look after everything digital. So our website, any digital platforms, and just ensuring that our members members and our customers have the best digital experience. Um, so we work, um, we've just signed on with Prodo. So we're a new partner of theirs. So we'll be working with them to help optimize our website and um, launch some really exciting digital products as well. Looking forward to getting started with you guys. It's, um, it's going to be a good good partnership moving forward. So thanks for that, Beth. Um, very, 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 very quick intro into Prodos. For those of you, most of you should will probably know who we are already if you're attending today. But just a quick note, just to say we are a digital transformation specialist agency. Um, over 50% of our business resides in the social housing space. And we've worked with housing associations for around 20 or so years. Um, essentially, what we do is provide solutions to help uh, housing providers connect and build better relationships with their residents through the likes of website development, customer portals, digitizing the lettings onboarding process, um, and everything sort of surrounding that. And we've recently just launched a self-service app as well, which we'll talk to you a little bit about later on today. Um, but yeah, always with a pure focus on customer experience whilst maintaining those integrations with third-party systems for data integrity, for internal efficiencies and these sorts of things. So that's sort of where we fit into the sector anyway. We do run um, multiple events and we run these housing hives every three to four weeks or so. So if you need to jump off today, if you want to go and have a little look at previous sessions, they're probably a topic that we've covered on there for you. Um, so we have video.proto.com forward slash hub is our video hub of all of our um, recorded, recorded events over the past. Um, so that's the intros done. We'll move on to today's session, which is just a bit of a roundup really of some of the topics from a digital perspective from housing 2022 last week so obviously it's a massive massive event across the three days we couldn't squeeze everything in and we were also pretty busy ourselves at our stand too so we didn't manage to actually get to as many talks as we wanted to but we've tried to include a little bit of a variety in this webinar today some of the talks we listened to some that we held ourselves and also one that beth chaired as well on day three um, but yeah we, we had a great time it was a tiring three days but very much worth it it felt like a great uplift on the uh, engagement and general sort of busyness of compared with last year which is obviously the first one post lockdown so big thank you to all of you who managed to come and catch us at the stand watch our demos or, or listen to our talks as well it was um it was great to be there and uh yeah we're looking forward to the next one so we've kind of broken this into into the three days basically and we'll talk to you about a few things which we heard and um we also had a speaker slot ourselves on each of the three days my colleague jenny who can't be with us today um, run through a few case studies so I'll give you a little bit of a snippet of some of the talks there obviously not the full the full the full works as they were they were an hour each 
Um, but yeah, the first one that we sat in on was uh, future gazing. So what are the major technology trends shaping the future of housing? And this was chaired by um, Kishore Rajanjan from Microsoft and Jenny Dawson from DIN as well. And they were looking at, um, well, it's something we're particularly interested in generally at Prodo really, because we're, we generally need to try and stay as curious as possible when it comes to innovation so we can continue to meet and exceed the needs of not only customer expectations, but um, technology advancements and make that make use of those for accessible solutions for customers, um, for the end customers. But Keyshaw took everyone actually through a live demo of some assistive technology at the event, as you can sort of see a little image of on the screen there of him doing just that, kind of exploring the potential power and use cases of AR, of augmented reality, which you can see um, that he's doing so there with the, he, he had a headpiece on, it was sort of displaying on the screen behind him. So I think this is going to be something we're seeing, going to see, be seeing a little bit more of the coming years, no doubt, in the, in the housing space. It's used elsewhere quite heavily already. Um, and what that will essentially provide is the option for the visualization of information around the home, as opposed to not only give customers um, an easy way to understand things like tenant responsibilities or reporting ASB or repairs, but also to provide things like helpful guides around the home as well. So you can just sort of imagine holding up your phone to a particular appliance or something and just sort of clicking on there um, to gain access to a particular guide or something similar like that. So possibilities are quite endless when it comes to AI and AR. So it's just about, I suppose, as we move through, as this technology advances, we move through the, the months and years of that advancement, finding the sort of balance really of, of making use of these new pieces of tech for accessible purposes for um, social housing residents, I guess, generally. But they also went through discussions around enabling connected ecosystems and immersive user productivity as well. We actually had a survey at our stand of sort of three tubes, some of you may have seen it, and people were sort of throwing ping pong balls in there for their answer around what's their biggest digital priority. Um, and one of those options was facilitating the fully sort of integrated comms approach with systems for customers. And whilst that was, it sort of scored three out of the three, so it was third, it definitely still got plenty of votes, so kind of in line with what they were discussing a little bit around um, connected ecosystems and, and productivity views, I suppose. Um, so yeah, kind of in line with what we were what we were uh, we were talking about on our stand as well. But quite exciting things as well in terms of how we can make use of things like AI and AR for um, so for social housing residents and, and make the most of this advancing technology as, as it ever inevitably changes. Don't know if anybody on the on the talk call today attended that one, so feel free to pop some thoughts into the chat if you did. Um, but the next one we we sat in on was the future of customer service, which had Matt from RHP, Alina Boyle from Origin, uh, Amanda Howard, uh, Amanda Leonard from Housemark, and David from AO.com. Um, and Matt actually followed up publicly with his key takeaways in this session, which is quite handy for us for today's talk. But yeah, he, his key takeaways from, from RHP's perspective was that um, we shouldn't always sort of focus on customer service ahead of thinking about the potential services uh, in terms of service design and delivery for customers themselves. It's quite easy just to think that fixing the contact center is, is the end game, but I suppose if that's stopping future developments and enhancements of service design, then I suppose focusing on the customer service of those should maybe come afterwards, but still maintain sort of informed, I suppose, so a little bit chicken and egg, but I think the service design and delivery should come first, followed by customer services, what Matt took from that anyway. Um, he also moved on to talk about digitization, which doesn't mean just sort of front end websites, um, front end customer portals and sort of things around that. It's, it's, it needs to form a, as we go back to the previous one around the sort of ecosystem approach. So if it's not connected to the back office, it's systems and the data sort of pooled here, there and everywhere, rather than being fully integrated and connected. It's going to be a bit of a struggle to make these digital front end systems meaningful for customers in terms of um, surfacing data, allowing them to interact with that data and, um, and log digital based inquiries rather than things like you know, more traditional methods. Matt also went on to talk about thinking about the cost of failure as well. So attempting to fix a specific problem for a specific customer is, is absolutely ideal and, and should certainly be thought of, but it comes to zero if if you allow that failure to happen again and again, which sort of feeds into the next one really nicely, which is if you are going to solicit feedback from customers, make sure you act upon it, make sure you're able to capture feedback from any of your touch points as well. So the people who go out to visit residents in some ways, maybe whether it be housing offices or otherwise, uh, are a hugely valuable source of feedback from that perspective. But yeah, I think taking customer feedback on board is something which I think most organizations 
certainly in the housing space do, but I think making sure acting upon it and making ch real change based upon that is all sort of feeds into putting the customer voice first as well. And then Matt's summary finished up with, is the customer always right is, is probably the wrong question to ask. It's more around, do your customers feel valued and listened to that being a more important thing, which again, sort of feeds into general sort of customer voice being, being, being at the forefront. Again, if you attended that talk and had any further thoughts, do feel free to pop it into the chat pane. But yeah, then we had um, our own Jenny Bradshaw, who's our head of client services, um, talk through a case study with our, one of our clients, Housing Solutions as well. So we've been working with Housing Solutions for a few years now, and they went through the sort of journey so far, the results they've seen with us, uh, and they're also last year's focus compared to this year. So I'll run through just three of Jenny's slides from that talk, which is that the journey with housing solutions from a digital transformation perspective, where Rich was concerned, I think he worked there for 16, 17 years, but it really started to change in 2016 when we partnered together, it initially focused on website development, portal development and integration. And then that sort of quickly moved into, you can see how it sort of um, translates here into insights and learning. So learning from behaviors and, and statistics on those platforms and upgrading them based upon that. And then we moved into crisis communications chatbot in, around COVID, which saw I think the stats were sort of around 90% of queries were automatically solved, which is amazing for the customer, amazing powers and solutions as well. And then it was onto AI. So we touched upon AI a little bit at the start, but the AI solution was customers can take a photo of their boiler. The AI will be able to understand the make and model of it to help repairs operatives get the, uh, the parts and the types of tools and things right first time in the appointment, but also that in turn sort of built up housing solutions asset management data, which was sort of a byproduct. But then, yeah, they moved into some results. So Housing Solutions have 72% of customers registered to their portal already, which is probably one of the highest we've seen. 28% of repairs are reported online and they've taken 3.5 million rent payments through the portal as well. But then, yeah, Jenny and Rich talked through um, the most recent launch, which is the native app that we've developed with them, which will be available for, for other housing associations very soon anyway. Um, and that's essentially the sort of self-service fundamentals which you'd expect to see, like integrations of back office systems, reporting and scheduling repairs and paying rent and things. But the benefits of things like th something like an app is the five specific functions like biometric login with face ID, push notifications for comms. If you think about um, almost like three layers of comms with customers. So the first one being traditional, I have a query and would to phone my provider to find out more or, or log something. And then the second layer would be I have a query, I want to find something, I log into my portal and find it myself or log it digitally. And then the last one would be using something like an app. And those push notifications, the housing association can proactively send comms out to the, to the device. So I don't even have to go and log in, don't have to phone up. I can just see the fact that my rent is on time or I have a repairs book tomorrow, for instance. So, so yeah, that's been great for them. It's gonna be launching soon. And, um, and yeah, if, if you're interested in hearing more about that, let us know. Um, anything else from, from day one, Beth, that you think would be worth mentioning from your perspective? I know you're quite busy on the stand on day one anyway. Yeah, we, we were so busy. It was such a great event. We had so many interesting conversations with uh, our members and, and other housing professionals. I'll just quickly touch on what you said about the app there. So um, your colleague Adam, he de demoed it to me. I will say like it, it literally is really awesome so there was lots of uh lots of good functionality on there that was um that really surprised us which would definitely i think help housing associations and other organizations um in this sector it was um really easy to use uh, um, and i was very really impressed so if anybody's interested in um that app definitely get in touch with prodo that was um really good but um no day one i mean lots of the common themes that came out of the conversations that i had um from kind of a CIH perspective. So obviously we were talking to our members about, you know, how are they keeping themselves up to date? How are they tackling the issues that they face on a day-to-day -day, um, basis? And a lot of the thing was that they just didn't have the time. They didn't really know where to go to get the knowledge and they didn't have the resource to be able to find it out. So it was a lot of the common themes throughout the whole three days was that there was not enough time and they're looking for systems and processes to be put in place to enable them to spend the time on the really important things to actually work with their customers so that was kind of the common theme from throughout the event um, as a whole really yeah i'd agree with that actually it, it, that's kind of similar to what, what we spoke to a lot of a lot of people about in terms of 
everyone's workload at the moment seems to be just growing and growing due to obviously various factors sort of off the back of COVID and, and, and the, the acceleration of digital projects generally. But yeah, I think um, I think system implementation and, and technology implementation to save time was, uh, yeah, again, another theme that, that we heard too. So I'd agree with you there. And thanks for the feedback on the app as well. I'll pass it on to Adam and the engineering team. I'd love, love to hear that. Um, we'll see it, see it on the recording actually soon. Um, so on to day two then, which was, um, again, absolutely rammed busy on day two. Um, we, were, we were kept busy on the stand all day with demos and conversations, but did manage to catch a couple of talks. Um, and the first one was technology for an Asian population, which um, there was plenty of people on the panel for this from Extra Care, from Housing LIN, Connected Places, Catapult, and a few others as well. Um, so these people were talking through essentially making use of technology for an Asian population generally, but all focused around utilizing that technology. And again, going back to sort of digital advancements in order to potentially extend the length of aging customers interdependence, independence when it comes to the latter stages of life, where I guess immediate care provisions aren't already in place. Obviously a big part of this, like any sort of project, any digital implementation generally is is customer research to gauge willingness and suitability, but market research to gain to gauge um, suitability of systems and products as well. But the fact technology advances so quickly to improve customer experience across the board, it almost feels like a bit of a no-brainer to sort of focus in this area as well to be able to offer those um, independent services or independent types of um, I don't just general sort of life management for people um, in their in their social housing homes. So. There was a couple of steps which the guys talked through, which is again similar to similar to a lot of projects we run, and most of you guys on the call will probably be familiar with, in that beginning with powerful constructive dialogue between change-inducing partners. So uh, upfront planning and finding out who's who's going to be involved from a stakeholder perspective and, and what that looks like in terms of involved customer impact and input, sorry. And then followed that by delivery in which routes to bring innovation to life are tested, crafted, and applied in line with that prior planning of, um, of stakeholder involvement and I suppose market and, and customer research as well. So that was a particularly quite an interesting one. Um, and then, yeah, following on from that on today two is another one from my colleague Jenny around a, a case study with RBH who rushed over our wide housing. She was joined by Zoe and Bede talking through the customer portal we've done for them, which is iterated over the years essentially. Um, we can work with them for, I think, five or six years, potentially on website development portals. And that's sort of changed as time's moved on. Um, but yeah, they've they've kind of focused on very much the, the approach which we quite like to take at Proda, which is the MVP, minimum viable product approach of requirements. It's something that we need to have live, that we can learn from and then sort of amend and adapt as time goes on with insights. So rather than being informed by only internal preference and only sort of board ambitions, et cetera, um, sort of leaning upon customer insight with the use of things like Hotjar and Google Analytics to understand um, traffic and page, uh, I suppose, hit rates and sort of dwell times and which areas the portal are used, but also Hotjar to understand user behaviors and, and potential user struggles as well. And they talked through a particular UK use case they found with Hotjar, which was that people were struggling to register because they had to go away and find their customer ID or registration ID, um, which was preventing them from doing so. And then they were just sort of giving up and maybe phoning in anyway. So that insight from Hotjar um, uh, sort of informed the guys to make a change in the front end of the registration user interface, which removed that requirement. And the results on screen are quite, quite, quite surprising, quite shocking, but that was the, the sort of the real stats around what that particular change resulted in, in terms of conversions and general registrations to their portal as well. Um, but yeah, the RBH are up to 50% customers registered, 20% repairs reported online and 500,000 pounds a week, uh, a month, sorry, uh, rent payments. What they're looking to next is digitizing the lettings, onboarding process and application process, similar to what we've done with Orbit Move, Accent and Plymouth Community Homes as well. So that's what we're coming ne up next for them. Um, but yeah, another great case study talk from Jen. And um, yeah, if, if you need to know more about that, then yeah, please feel, to, free, feel free to get in touch. And then on to the third day. Um, and again, if anyone attended the RBH talk and had any further thoughts, just let us know in the chat. That'd be great to see. 
But yeah, onto the third day, which was um, where Beth, you you uh, chaired the social media talk with a few other people. So I thought I'd let you talk through this one and, and the, the blog post and things you put together afterwards, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so just to touch back, sorry, just back on to day two, what you were saying about um, hot jar and data. So yeah. just to reiterate as well, one of the things that we've been working on in the last year is using hot jar and using Google Analytics to understand what our customers are doing and being able to make um, insight driven decisions based on that, because I think it's really easy to make changes based on opinions like you think this might not work, but actually taking it back and looking what the customer's doing is so important because you can fix an issue like that that sign up process so easy just yeah. by changing the field so we're definitely um we're doing that at the moment and we're having a look at all of our digital platforms so our website and everything and and using that sort of stuff so if there's something to take away there it's definitely to to go back and have a look at your analytics i think that's super important yeah um, and yeah, so, oh, sorry, Jake, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I, I wondered how, how long you've been running that for and if you found any, anything in particular so far in terms of insight. Yeah, so um, one of the big things for us is we launched a new customer portal um, in 2018 at the end of the year. Um, it was kind of built um, as a bit of a, we just need the functionality to work, um, but yeah. it wasn't built customer led so what we found is that our abandonment rates when people are trying to purchase things or sign up for membership or buy a training course are really really high and the sign up process really difficult and we were wondering why we were kind of where people are getting stuck but hot jar and um, analytics has allowed us to see that there are certain things that are happening that are stopping our customers from being able to get from a point of applying or paying so we're actually losing money so one of the things that we're focusing on with you guys this year is obviously to create a new portal and build a new sign up process to enable our customers to get onto their their my cih account and actually do the things that they that they want to do on there amazing yes i suppose when, when we approach these sorts of projects when we're working with someone like yourselves we've already done that bit of research in terms of like insights and existing platform it just makes everything you know it gives everyone a little bit more confidence in terms of what's going to be changed or rebuilt is going to be for the benefit of the end customer, I suppose, in the business generally. So Definitely. Um, yeah, part of my role, we don't ever in our team change anything on the website um, unless we've got data or evidence or actual customer feedback to back yeah. it up. Because I think one of the things that I try and like work by is don't reinvent the wheel. If something doesn't need changing and it's working, you can optimize it and you can make it better, but you, you don't need to completely change it just based off um, people's opinions. If you've got actual customer insight, that's when you you know you need to look at what you need to do to improve something. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, day three. So um, on day three, I was on a panel. Um, I was on a panel with SoCrowd, um, they're a social media company, and Hide Housing. Um, and we talked about social media and the importance of how housing associations can use it to make real change in their organisation. So there was a couple of key themes, and I'll drop the link into the chat after because I did write an article after the um, event just to talk about um, what we kind of talked about on the panel and some of the questions that the um, the audience had. So one of the main things um, that I've picked out of um, housing associations using their social media is that a lot of them have it because they have to have it and they're not quite sure what their strategy is, but they know they have to have it because that's where their customers and their residents are. Um, one of the things is it's it's a complaints forum. So a lot of the conversations I was having with um, people is that, you know, it's just mainly customers and residents. It's a complaint channel um, and it needs to be more of a resident forum. So that's kind of the shift that housing associations are trying to make is to make it more of a community, an online community, rather than it just purely being a complaints channel. It still will be a, a, a channel complaints um, but you need to have a clear goal and strategy of what you want your social media to do to enable your customers and residents to speak properly so one of the questions um, that the panel had and, and I think the whole theme of it was how do you deal with negativity on social media um, and Hyde Housing had a really great example of the work that they'd done um, but it's not to um, stop the negativity because everybody has a voice and everybody's voice on social needs to be acknowledged. So you cannot stop negative comments or complaints. And one of the questions that we had was, how do you deal with um, 
a customer or a resident that, that's put something on social media that's that's not factual um, about you know your organization or something that's happened and it's a negative comment and they he sort of said look we've got two options we ignore it or we reply but we risk if we reply that we can be quite patronizing and it might seem a bit obnoxious um, so we talked about a third option which would be to drive engagement on your social media so have a clear strategy in place what does your business what is the return of if you have social media account and what do you want it to do so do you want it to be a resident forum are you looking to post general updates on there and do you have a channel for customer contact so complaints and feedback people getting in touch and once you start to build that up and you start to build your customer engagement you'll start to have a bit of a forum where then if you have negative comments hide housing they had their customers replying to their own other negative comments so they were sorting starting to sort it out themselves which was really interesting so they didn't actually need to step in because they had other residents and other customers that were so engaged on their socials they were actually answering those complaints for them which is where i think we need to get to is that's something cih have really tried to focus on is build up a bit of a large community online where we start the conversations and we get involved but any questions that come in or any kind of negative feedback we have other members and customers that actually start to step in so we can we can acknowledge it and we're listening to it but we don't necessarily need to respond in some instances so that was something that was a really key topic that we talked about um, and the other one um, is keeping up with the pace so one of the things that i think we all struggle with is how fast it changes on a daily on a daily basis and the nine to five doesn't work anymore on social media because it's happening outside of working hours on the weekends it doesn't really stop so we were talking about what works one week might not work the next week so how do you how do you work with that so something that CIH have done is to understand how each of the platforms work so we don't we used to post the same thing on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook all at the same time, but we understood that the algorithms and the purpose of each social media platform is so different and your users are using it for a different thing at a different time of the day each day. So we understood our analytics a little bit more using um, Twitter analytics, our Hootsuite that we use, and we try to gather information on what our customers are doing, when are they engaging, when are they what are they interacting with and why are they on there? And once we started to understand that, you can start to really um, plan your posts and your strategy on each platform. So we post lots of different content types. So a video might work really well today, and then next week you might post a similar thing and, and it doesn't do very well. But what we noticed is, is that there are customers are at different places. They might not be able to watch a video out loud, which is why we do lots of different content types for the same message. So you can access it via video or we'll post it as a poll. We might start a discussion. It might be a, a downloadable publication. So trying to do that will then get better customer engagement on social media. Um, but I will post the article that I did. It's got some four top tips on kind of where to start if you're not sure where to start or how to kind of make your social media a little bit better if you're struggling with that. So I'll post that in the chat now. I'll drop that link in for you, Beth, already. Oh, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> It was, it was an interesting one. It was one of the talks I actually managed to catch on the final day. Um, and yeah, everyone was really engaged with it because I think, and yeah, you, you're right, Beth, I, I sort of took that off as well that generally people are quite worried about the negativity of social media because historically people just, people will, if they have a negative experience, they'll look for places to vent if they're not getting what they want in terms of complaints. So social is a natural place to do it, if not like a review site. but. Yeah, you're right. If, if there's no strategy behind how customers should be engaging with you on social end, they will just use it for that. But if if there's if there's reasons for them to engage other than that, then the likelihood is they'll, they'll engage in other means other than just complaints. So, yeah. yeah. But, um, um, I'll just touch. I was just going to say, Emily's popped something in the chat. So I completely agree. Like, um, so when we do have negativity or there is a comment, we always engage. Um, I think there's also a fine line between, I think one of the things that we talked about was like obviously abuse on social media. Um, so a lot of housing organizations have policies, so we don't re respond to that. But in terms of making sure they know that we're listening, absolutely. We always kind of say, you know, if, if we see a discussion going on, we, we might jump in. And if something is factually incorrect, it depends on the, the messaging, but we usually say, you know, 
we can we, you can find the correct information here or did you know or we might take it offline and, and send them a direct message but absolutely agree with your point Emily I think it's really important to show that you're listening by making sure as well that you put your first name in there so we have so many people using our social media accounts and we try to make it more personal so we say you know it's, it's Beth from from CIH and I'm, I'm here up to help I'm listening to what you're saying so absolutely agree I think on those negative comments um, it's about having that community there as well ready especially when you're not on the nine to five um, and you might be on a weekend not looking at the socials you do have a reliant community there to help as well so I think it's more of a working alongside them um, rather than not letting them kind of do it but you also can rely on them as well. well thanks, for, thanks for that question Emily as well. Um, great stuff any more questions on that before we, um, before we move into the final section? Feel free to pop them in. We can, we can always revisit them at the end if we need to as well. Um, the only other talk we managed to get to, well, I managed to get to on the final day was um, the third of the third of Jenny's. She, Jenny was quite busy across the three days, as you, as you can see, one a day. Um, but yeah, she was talking through um, the Stockport Homes case study, which was that we've worked with them for many years, I think probably eight years or so, but she's been recently reappointed to deliver six new websites for their subsidiary brands and their sort of interdependent companies underneath the group. Um, and yeah, Verity and Paul Howes joined us, which um, are from obviously from the group, but talking about sort of prioritization of multiple stakeholder groups and those different organizations, um, putting the customer voice first and delivering the projects generally at scale with success and also some, some, good, some good results. So how we sort of approach this from our perspective is the sort of key, four key stages to a, to a website build, which is planning, design, build and launch. But obviously we had six of them to do at once and um, all sort of agreed at once and, and contracted at once. So Paul and Verity talked through in terms of like um, prioritization for them from their perspective, because it was it, it made no big difference to us from our, from our perspective at Prode, it was all around the client's priorities. Um, so they basically just sort of gauged internally which one of these companies was, was most ready to have their website delivered first, because there's obviously internal planning and customer engagement and things that needs to be done. Um, which was the group website first, followed by Stop at Homes general needs. And then we're sort of trickling down now in a, in a staggered approach. Um, and we're just about to launch website four, which is Viaduct. Um, but really interestingly, Verity used the stat of, they've actually involved 1,500 customers um, in terms of feedback or, or involvement in one way or another as part of this progress, part of this project progress, which is, I think, is an, an amazing number. I was really involved in the, I led the tender response and the pitch when we were um, bidding for the work and they went as far as including customers on the presentation, which we were, which we were um, presenting to them as part of our proposal process. So customers even had a say on sort of supplier selection, supplier selection and, um, and asking all sorts of questions to us on the pitch. So that was really interesting, but yeah, they've used things again, like hot jar and um, GA, but also things like the tree jack surveys that we use, which is like, um, almost like an anonymous sort of navigational wireframe to enable people to hopefully get to the end result and feedback if not. But yeah, 1,500 customers have been involved throughout, which is which is excellent. Um, and you can see um, three, three of the six websites are live already, so we'll pop those in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, end result was bespoke website design for each of the six organizations, um, three of them live already. But the, the reason for it was that prior we had like a, um, a website sort of microsite builder so they could spin up a website nice and quickly for a different brand but it looked very similar other than the logo and colors but they grew to a point where each of these companies each of these individual brands have their own sort of growth strategies their own challenges ambitions their own service offerings so that kind of got old for them quite quickly so yeah now it's separate instance for each separate presence for each um, their own teams can then focus on that particular company at any one time and, and sort of focus on the ambitions of that particular company, which has been great for them so far. They actually saw a 40% um, a increase in conversions on a particular form um, in month one of the new Stop for Home General Needs website going live, which is great. But yeah, some of the takeaways from Verity was um, to make sure that data and insight, again, a the theme that we mentioned throughout this today, Data and insight is used to uh, prioritize change. Customer voice is key. Make sure the brand's articulated with clarity. Um, promotion to customers and colleagues being consistent across the board as well. Um, and generally just sort of keeping an open mind as, as things move forward because things inevitably change as, as you move through and requirements are discussed and things get launched and, and people sort of interacting with these platforms. So 
open mind is uh, is really important as well. But yeah, that sort of summarised really the the event for us from the few talks that we did, some of the others that we sat in on, including Beth's from from CIH and the conversations we had about social. Um, but yeah, I can't actually see the chat things. I'm sharing my screen. So if anyone's got any further questions for myself, for Beth, from anyone else at the Prodo team, or even just sort of discussion between yourselves, then yeah, feel free to pop them in the chat or come off mute and we can have a bit of a chat for the final few minutes. Um, if not, no problems at all. But any any final thoughts from you, Beth, if we've got no final questions? No, I think I think this whole kind of insight data, I think, yeah, I think there needs to be time to be uh, made in your organization to look at it so obviously going back to the time and resource i mean all of these people i spoke to want to do it they're all like really on board yes we want to look at that it's just finding the time so i think um i think one of the organizations i spoke to they did the, they do a thing on a friday where they have no meetings and they have a knowledge hour where they go and they kind of spend time you know increasing their knowledge what do they need to find out about and then they have an hour of like insight so what have they learned from the customers this week on social anything through their website is there any digital projects that have been worked on how can we kind of gather that feedback so i think that's something that um, other organizations need to be aware of that it's the day-to-day -day stuff is just as important as actually finding out what your customers needs are are, what's happening behind the scenes because there's so many quick fixes you can do when you start to look at your kind of website data or your social media data you can start to understand you know how your customers want to receive information and what they're doing and make really quick wins which will save you time in the future so yeah I kind of try to spend a couple of hours a week looking at that stuff so that we can start to make quick wins on our website um, that, that I can do myself so it just might be optimizing a page or looking at the content um, but yeah it's definitely um, it was definitely a really great event so um, I'm looking forward to next year yeah yeah no, I'd echo that yeah we, we really enjoyed it it was a it was a super busy one definitely the busiest one that I've been to since my time at Proda which is nearly five years or so um, yeah it was great we had some great conversations and yeah these these sort of themes you talked about today around data and insight time saving um, from technology and digital was was yeah consistent throughout. So no, it was really good. And and thanks for your time for joining us today, Beth. Really appreciate it. And the insights that you brought from your talk were, were great. So I would encourage everyone to go, go away and read that that blog post that Beth put together. And um, we will, I've recorded this as well. So if you want to share this with anyone internally, we'll um we'll follow up by email with the link to the recording. Um, but yeah, thanks again for everyone's time today and thanks again to you, Beth. Thanks for having me. It's been great. No problem at all. Thanks, guys. All right. Enjoy the rest Cheers. of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.